the second talk of the morning session. So for the second talk, we're going to have Zoe Fan from Yale, who's going to be telling us about orthogonal invariant spin glasses and linear models of invariant designs. The floor is yours, Zoe. OK, thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for the introduction. Uh, I want to start by thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation to come. So I, I'm, I'm not a physicist by training. I think I'm very far from being a physicist. Uh, and my first exposure to ICTP was a couple years ago during this um, Youth in High Dimensions workshop that Jean has been organizing for many years. Uh, I think this was at the time organized between Jean, Marco, and Sebastian, and Mary Lou. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience for me, and I think this, this work, this, um, this Youth in High Dimensions has uh, played an important role in bringing together a lot of young people in this community over the past uh, years. Uh, and at that time, this, this was in the middle of COVID, so I wasn't able to come to Trieste in person. I was participating in this uh, virtually. Uh, so I was very happy to receive an invitation to come again for, for, for this workshop here. That's, again, organized by Jean and Shubo and Prakia uh, uh, and, and, and Manuel. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. So th uh, thanks for the invitation. So uh, the work I'm going to talk about today is joint work with, with Shubha Brato, uh, my, my, my friend who is uh, co-organizing this workshop. Um, Yufan Lee is a PhD student at Harvard Statistics who is uh, working with Shubha Brato and Prakia jointly. Uh, and I guess through my acquaintance with Shubha and Prakia, I've had really the great fortune and privilege of being able to work with Yufan together on a couple projects. Uh, so I hope that maybe he will be part of one of the future editions of Youth in High Dimensions and that you'll be able to hear about some of this work directly from him. Uh, and then Yi Hong Wu is my colleague at, uh, at, at Yale SNDS, who is uh, a friend and a uh, personal mentor of mine as well. Yeah. Great. So this talk is going to be uh, about two main models, and they're, they're quite standard models, so I'm not going to say too much in the, in the way of motivation. Uh, and I will just start by telling you what are the models and what are the results that we were uh, able to prove. Uh, and then hopefully I'll have some time to go into some of the high level ideas of, of how we do the proofs. So this will be the structure of the talk. So the two models, the, the motivating example, the, the model that uh, we were primarily interested in uh, was this uh, very classical Bayesian linear model. You have a measurement design that I'll call A. It's M, M measurements and uh, N, N regression coefficients. Uh, and then I'll put ourselves in a Bayesian setting where the unknown signal vector here denoted X star has uh, IID entries. Uh, and I'll assume that they're, uh, so, so, so they're IID, they come from this prior distribution pi. Uh, and I'll use capital X star to denote also the common law of these signal components. Uh, and for the noise, I'll assume that they're IID Gaussian. Uh, if we write down the posterior distribution of X star given these measurements, it would take this form, right? So you would have this, uh, this, this quadratic term coming from the likelihood due to the Gaussian noise, and then you would have this product of pi. This is the product prior over, over the variable. Uh, and then I'm going to use uh, sigma as the dummy variable to denote a sample from this uh, posterior to distinguish it from the true signal X star. Yeah, so hopefully that won't be confusing. Uh, and then in, in, uh, for purposes of statistical estimation, we'd oftentimes be interested, for example, in computing the posterior mean of X star. Right? So in this notation, it would be the ensemble average or the Gibbs average of this vector sigma over this distribution. Uh, and, and I'll use this bracket notation throughout the talk to denote this kind of ensemble average. Okay. Uh, and the kinds of questions that we're interested in are, are, uh, are asymptotic questions of the following form. Uh, as M and N, the number of measurements and the number of signal components, go to infinity, uh, what is the limit of the mutual information between the unknown signal vector X star and your observation vector Y? Uh, if I were to compute this posterior mean estimator and look at its mean squared error, then what is the limit of this mean squared error in this asymptotic limit as M and N go to infinity? Uh, and then for the purposes of doing variational Bayesian inference, if I want to actually compute an approximation to this mean, can we write down a system of mean field equations that characterize this posterior mean? Right? So these are the kinds of questions that I hope to uh, be able to talk about. The second model, so in order to study these questions, we started our uh, work, I guess, a couple years ago by studying a simpler model, um, but that has uh, similar characteristics. So the second model I want to talk about is the spin glass model. Uh, it's the model that you see here, where uh, the Hamiltonian of the model is, uh, is a quadratic Hamiltonian. Uh, the, the, 
the vector sigma here, I'll just assume are plus one, minus one uh, easing spins in this model rather than having a general prior. And the Hamiltonian consists of these two terms. One is this quadratic couplings term defined by this couplings matrix J. It's a symmetric M by N matrix uh, scaled by an inverse temperature parameter beta that's positive. Uh, and then there's a linear term that's this external field which is defined by this vector H. Okay, and, th and throughout the talk, just for simplicity, let me assume that uh, the coordinates of this external field H are, are IID coming from some uh, common distribution and that common law I'll denote by this variable capital H. Okay, uh, and again, we might be interested in computing something like the mean of this distribution. This is what I'll refer to as the magnetization uh, and it's, it's the ensemble average of this draw sigma from this measure. Yeah. Uh, and and I, sh I, I should say, if you have any questions during the talk, please do feel free to interrupt as we go. Okay, and the questions that uh, we hope to be able to uh, think about in this, in this model are, again, are analogous questions. So uh, for certain models of the random couplings matrix J, which I'll clarify in a moment, uh, asymptotically as n goes to infinity, what is the limit, uh, first order limit of the, of the normalized free energy, one over n times log partition function? Uh, and if I want to write down a system of mean field equations for, for the mean or magnetization of this distribution, uh, what would what, what these equations look like? Okay. Uh, and let me just clarify uh, right off the bat that, we're, that the results that I'm going to talk about in this talk are uh, restricted only to a high temperature regime of this model. So we're not going to talk about any, uh, any, any, any low temperature phenomena. Okay. okay, so for both of these models, these questions are quite well studied and quite well understood in the settings where your disorder uh, matrix has independent entries, right? So for example, if I start with the second of these two models, uh, the spin glass model, and I consider the case where the coordinates of this couplings matrix J are IID Gaussian, let's say scaled with variance one over N, uh, then this is the standard SK model. And uh, in the high temperature regime, in other words, for small enough uh, beta positive, uh, it's understood that many properties of this model are characterized by a single scalar overlap parameter, which I'm denoting here by Q star. Uh, this parameter solves the fixed point equation. Q star is the expectation of the hyperbolic tangent of uh, H plus beta root Q star times Z. Here H is, the, uh, if I remind you, H is the common law for the entries of the external field vector. Uh, and then Z here is a standard Gaussian variable that's independent of H. Okay, okay so in, in high temperature regimes, what's understood is that this, uh, the, the free energy one over n log Z has an almost sure limit that's predicted by this replica symmetric kind of formula. Uh, and the magnetization vector approximately satisfies a system of mean field equations that, are, uh, that go by the name of the TAP or the uh, Dallas Anderson Palmer equations. Uh, and I'm writing approximately equal here and I'll, I'll make a bit more precise what this approximately equals uh, means later when I state a result. Uh, and okay, so the kinds of um, the kinds of mathematical tools that have been used to to prove these results over the years. So there there have been there have been several different techniques and tools. Uh, perhaps most notably is a combination of an interpolation argument together with Stein's Gaussian integration by parts lemma uh, that was introduced by Guerra and further developed by Talagrand. Uh, and to prove uh, the TAP equations, you can use this in the context of a cavity method, which is also made rigorous by, by Talagrand. Uh, and there have been a few other techniques based around um, studying a dynamical evolution of this Hamiltonian. So if I study a Brownian motion that uh, reaches this eventual Hamiltonian J, and then using stochastic calculus to understand uh, the dynamics along this evolution. Uh, but but I, what, what I want to emphasize here maybe is that a lot of these techniques uh, rely quite strongly on this assumption that the entries of this couplings matrix are independent, right? So they use this independence in a crucial way when constructing these cavity fields and doing these analyses. Uh, okay, and, and the, 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 the models that I'll talk about are rotationally invariant models to give a little teaser where we don't have this independence. Okay, so in the uh, Gaussian linear model, there's... Um, there are very analogous results that have been developed. Uh, so if I look at this Gaussian linear model and assume that uh, the entries of this measurement design are again IID Gaussian with the variance here I'm calling beta over N, uh, then in the limit as M and N go to infinity proportionally and their ratio converges to alpha, uh, many properties of this model are characterized by some equivalent scalar channel or single letter characterization model, right? So the scalar channel is uh, it's the following form. I just have one single observation or one single draw from this prior distribution that I'm calling capital X star. 
and then you observe this uh, in a Gaussian channel. So, so corrupted with some Gaussian noise, uh, and then the signal to noise ratio parameter uh, of the scalar channel I'm denoting here by gamma star. Yeah, so you observe this, this, observe, this noisy observation of X star, which I'm calling here Y, uh, and then the characterization is that, so, so this gamma star solves a system of two fixed point equations. Uh, you have this eta star inverse is, is the expected posterior variance of estimating X star in the scalar channel. In other words, it's the Bayes optimal MMSC uh, in this scalar observation model. Uh, and then gamma star is related back to eta star via these two parameters, alpha and beta, right? The variance of your uh, measurement entries and then the aspect ratio m over n. Okay. Uh, okay, and what's understood about this is that if I look at the limit Bayes mean squared error in the original linear model, it coincides with uh, the Bayes MMSE in the scalar channel, this eta star inverse. The mutual information between the signal vector x star and y in the linear model has a, a limit that's related to the scalar channel mutual information in some simple way. Uh, and then the posterior mean vector in, in, the, uh, in this Bayesian linear model satisfies a system of mean field equations that you can think about as uh, perhaps analogous to the TAP equations. Uh, and again, uh, the, the, the tools that have been used, or a lot of the tools that have been used to prove these kinds of things over the years, actually a lot of them develop by Jean, where I learned a lot of this literature myself, um, are extensions of, of these interpolation ideas of Guerra, uh, notably this adaptive interpolation method of Jean that can achieve both upper and lower bounds. Um, in, in this context, it's, it's curious that uh, there's an additional body of tools that seem available for these information theoretic models that don't seem available in pure spin glass contexts. Uh, so we have the IMMSE relation between the mutual information and, uh, and, and the Bayes optimal mean squared error. Uh, and then there are algorithmic arguments that you can do using AMP. Um, and then uh, arguments around uh, the so-called area argument of integrating the IMMSE relation. And these, these, these ideas go back as far as um, Montanari and Say in 2006 for analyzing these kinds of models. Okay, so what I want to talk about in today's talk is, uh, so we were, uh, I guess, back a couple years ago, we started to think about these kinds of models and settings where uh, the entries of the disorder, so if in the regression context, the design, uh, they are not uh, IID, they're, they're not independent. And we were motivated by these kinds of questions because we wanted to apply some of this high-dimensional mean field theory to, to problems of statistical inference with real data. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's sort of clear in a lot of examples of real data that the spectral properties of the matrices we're looking at were very far from, from what is described by IID kinds of matrices. Uh, and our motivations, I think, were, were quite well explained in the talk by Rishabh back a couple of days ago that the hope is that if, if you have a theory um, of, of these results around rotationally invariant, orthogonally invariant models, that, they're, 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 that these results would be valid for a universality class of matrices that extends uh, beyond the universality class of IID Gaussian matrices. Yeah, so the models that I'm actually gonna talk about today, for the spin glass context, it'll be this orthogonal SK model. Uh, it looks the same as the previous SK model, except that rather than assuming that the entries of J are IID Gaussian, uh, I'll consider a couplings matrix J that's orthogonally invariant in law. Uh, what I mean by this is just that uh, the eigenvectors of J are Haar uniform distributed on the orthogonal group independently of the eigenvalues. Uh, and then asymptotically, as n goes to infinity, I'll assume that the empirical spectral distribution of this matrix J converges weakly and uh, what I'll call strongly to a compactly supported limit law D. So by strongly, I just mean that um, the upper and lower endpoints of support converge to the endpoints of support of this limit law. Uh, and again, okay, so, so the theory around these things, I guess, from, from a rigorous perspective, I think, uh, is, 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 uh, is less developed and much more of what I'm going to say is conjectural at the moment. Uh, so what's, what's uh, believed should, should, should be true is that, um, again, a lot of the characteristics of this model are characterized uh, in, in the high temperature regime by a, sim by a single scalar overlap parameter Q star. It solves a system of fixed point equations that you see here where uh, entering into the system of fixed point equations is the derivative of the R transform of this limit spectral law of D. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you want to understand the limit free energy, you can compute this using the replica method. Uh, this computation was done by Marinari, Parisi, and Retort back in 94. Uh, I'll show a formula for this on the next slide, but the free energy will be characterized by the solution of this fixed point system. Uh, Q star and sigma star. 
Uh, and then you can also derive a system of tap equations or tap type equations uh, that characterize the magnetization in this model. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware of two quite distinct derivations of these equations in the literature. Uh, one is this high temperature expansion approach, I guess building on the approach of Plefka by Parisi and Potters in 95. Uh, and then the second approach uh, was done by Oper and Winter in this uh, adaptive cavity method kind of approach where uh, they introduced a new idea to close the system of uh, means and variances for the parameters of the cavity fields. Uh, in terms of rigorous results, I guess before we started looking into this model, I think there, it was very sparse. So uh, my collaborator, Shibaroto, uh, with Bashar Bhattacharya had shown the following, that if you're in this model without an external field, uh, then in the high temperature regime, uh, the, they, they, they proved uh, rigorously the limit of the, of the free energy of the log partition function. In the setting with no external field, the model has a special symmetry that um, causes the, uh, the, 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 the annealed free energy to coincide with the quench one. So, so in this case, you don't need the full replica method to compute the free energy, right? You can just do a second moment calculation. Uh, and this was made rigorous using a spherical integral analysis by Bhattacharya and Shen. Okay, so our result in the setting, this, I guess this goes back a couple of years ago now, is the following. Uh, for all values of beta, uh, that's sufficiently small, and sufficiently small depends on the limit spectral law of your couplings matrix. Uh, first of all, the fixed point Q star sigma star of that equation is unique, uh, and then the limit free energy converges to this, this to this replica symmetric prediction that was computed by uh, Marinari, Parisi, and Retort, and, and the equation is the one you see here. I think, if I understand correctly, the the full conjecture might be the following: that, that this uh, this result sh should hold in a full high temperature regime that's defined by this pair of two conditions. The first is uh, an analog of the AT condition for the SK model, uh, translated into this orthogonally invariant context. Uh, and then the second condition here is a condition that this argument beta times one minus Q star belongs to the domain of the R transform uh, that arises in this model. Okay. Uh, and then on the side of TAP equations, this is with Shubaroto and Yu Fan. Um, we uh, were able to show the following, again, for sufficiently small beta, where sufficiently small depends on the limit uh, distribution D. The magnetization of this model indeed satisfies uh, the TAP equations that were predicted by Parisi and Potters uh, in, in this kind of L2 sense. So the squared deviation across all coordinates, the, the, the mean squared deviation of the magnetization was predicted by the TAP equation goes to zero as, as n goes to infinity. In the uh, rotationally invariant linear model, there, there's a similar kind of picture. So if I consider this linear model, where now the entries of this uh, design matrix A are not IID Gaussian, but let me assume that uh, A transpose A uh, as a symmetric matrix is orthogonally invariant in law. Right? And it's quite natural to look at A transpose A because if you think about the Hamiltonian in the Bayes posterior distribution, the quadratic term is exactly defined by minus A transpose A. Right? So if I assume that this is rotationally invariant in law and the spectral distribution again converges weakly and strongly to a limit that I'll denote as d squared as m and n go to infinity, uh, then again, there's, there's uh, conjecturally a single letter characterization of this model. So if I denote now by Rz the R transform of minus d squared, uh, then there's an equivalent scalar channel that that's, that supposedly uh, characterizes this, this model. Uh, where the SNR parameter gamma star of the scalar channel solves this extended system of, of, of uh, two fixed point equations, and you see the R transform of this limit spectral law again appearing in the definition of this fixed point system. Uh, okay, so on, on the, on, uh, for this model, uh, you can again compute the limit of the free energy or the limit mutual information using the replica method. Uh, and you get a replica symmetric formula that I'll show on the next slide. I, I think that this was first done by Takeda, Uda, and Kawashima in 06. Uh, and for other types of priors, this was, this was maybe extended by Tulino, Kerr, Verdu, and Shamai. Uh, the posterior mean in this model, you can again characterize by a system of tap type mean field equations. Uh, and there have been uh, many different derivations or approaches to deriving these equations in the literature. Uh, one of them is this expectation consistency framework that was developed by Oper and Winter. And I think for this model, this computation was carried out by Kawashima and Vekapara. 
Uh, you can derive these through these vector AMP iterations developed by Ranga Schneider and Fletcher. Uh, and then uh, wh where I learned a lot of this, uh, this, this literature from was this nice paper by uh, Maillard, Fuini, Castanelos, uh, Kazakala, Mezard, and Zdebarova uh, in 2019. This was a paper in the Journal of Statistical Mechanics. Uh, where they connected a lot of these different uh, frameworks and showed that you can also derive these type equations by an extension of the high temperature expansion approach of Parisian potters. Okay, and again, on the side of rigorous results, much, much less is known about this model. So there was a nice results back in 2018 by uh, Barbier, Macri, Maillard, and Kazakala who uh, proved that this mutual information indeed converges to this replica symmetric formula. Uh, in the case where this design matrix A factorizes as a product of individual matrices, each of them having IID entries, and the last one has IID Gaussian entries, so that it's rotationally invariant in law. Uh, and this proof was using an adaptive interpolation argument to uh, do the interpolation on this last Gaussian matrix. Uh, and then somewhat related to our work, so back a couple years ago, there was a work of Gerbalo, Abara, and Gazakala, who studied uh, not the Bayesian model that I'm talking about today, but uh, this kind of regression problem with a convex, uh, with, with, with a convex regularizer. So they were looking at this in the context of convex empirical risk minimization rather than Bayesian inference, uh, and they were able to rigorously establish also a replica prediction for the limiting uh, error of these, of these uh, least squares estimators with convex penalties. Okay, so for, for this model, the result that we were able to show uh, so far is, is the following. That, uh, so suppose that you have this prior distribution for the coordinates of your regression vector. Uh, it's mean zero, and then we have a technical condition for the prior that includes the following two cases. One of them is if it has compact support on some interval minus theta c. The other is if it has a density over the entire real line, but this density is strongly log concave on the entire real line. Uh, and and there, is a, there is a more tedious and technical condition uh, that, that, that I won't elaborate upon in this, in this talk today. But so the result is the following then. Uh, for, some, uh, for some beta naught that depends, let's say, on the length of the support, uh, if the support of this limiting spectral distribution of A transpose A, the support of this variable D squared, is contained in an interval of length at most beta naught, and you should think about this as a, uh, a sort of high temperature condition after you center and rescale uh, the, the, the prior, or sorry, uh, uh, after you center and rescale the spectral distribution. Uh, then we're able to show the following, that the fixed point of the system is indeed uh, unique. The mutual information uh, has a limit that is predicted by this replica symmetric formula, and it's the formula that you see here. It involves uh, the mutual information of the scalar channel. Uh, the Bayes mean squared error uh, has a limit that's, that coincides with the mean squared error of the scalar channel. This is just this parameter eta star inverse. Uh, and then the posterior mean of this model does satisfy a system of tap type equations. This, it's the one that you see here. And again, we prove this in a sort of uh, L2 kind of sense. So the average square discrepancy uh, goes to zero. Uh, okay, and I think the, the full conjecture here, I mean, so this, this, this is a Bayesian model with a correctly specified prior, so it's, 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 it's believed to be replica symmetric. In fact, it's, it's, it's known by quite generic uh, arguments that the overlap does concentrate. Um, and so I think the full conjecture here is that these, these results should hold without this kind of high temperature condition for, for the spectral support, that we, should, we shouldn't need this condition that the support of D squared is contained in this small interval. Okay, but this is open. Okay, let me pause here uh, and see if there are any questions before I move on. Okay, if not, so for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is just to uh, maybe go through some of the uh, sort of high level or bird's eye view of the proof ideas of, of these results and how we prove these things. So let me start with the free energy in the, um, in the SK kind of model. Uh, and okay, underlying all of our results, we're using this, uh, this argument or this technique that was uh, developed by Balthausen for the SK model somewhat recently, I think 2018, uh, which this, this idea of conditioning, uh, this idea of doing a conditional analysis of the free energy conditioned on iterations of an AMP or TAP kind of algorithm for, for computing a fixed point of the TAP equations. So in the SK model, the argument looks like the following, and then this is some rough summary, I, th I think, of what was done by Bolthausen. 
you consider uh, these TAP or AMP iterations for solving the TAP equations in this model, and for the SK model, it looked like this. Uh, and then this matrix J, the couplings matrix in SK would be GOE. So if I want, I can write it as Z plus Z transpose, where Z is an asymmetric matrix with IIT Gaussian entries. Uh, and then up to some fixed iteration, which I'm calling here little t of this algorithm, you define the sigma field or the filtration that's generated by the iterates of this algorithm, the, the, these M iterates, uh, and then these iterates multiplied by Z and Z transpose. Yeah, and you consider this generator filtration. And the idea inside of Wolthausen is that uh, if you compute the first and second moments of the partition function, not unconditionally, but conditioned on the filtration generated by this algorithm, uh, then they're going to coincide with, with the replica prediction. So uh, the, the, the replica symmetric formula and two times the replica symmetric formula. Uh, and then because, because this, fr this free energy one over n log z concentrates exponentially around its mean, uh, this is enough to imply that uh, unconditionally the free energy converges to this replica symmetric prediction. Yeah. Uh, and maybe some, some amount of intuition of, about this, this construction uh, might be the following, right? So if you have a model without the external field, I guess the reason why the second moment agrees with the first moment is because uh, the mean or magnetization of the model is fixed at zero, and if you do the second moment analysis, it's going to depend on this uh, this overlap order parameter. And it, without the external field, this order parameter is maximized at q star equals zero. Right. So this is the point where your second moment is going to coincide with the first moment. And once you have this this um, this this external field, the 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 q star parameter is no longer zero. But what conditioning on these type iterations allows you to do is essentially to recenter the model around where the magnetization of the model should be. And then if you look at two replicas centered around that point, uh, then, then, then in the second moment calculation, they should be orthogonal. And so you can recover the second moment uh, kind of condition. Uh, and th there was an idea that was uh, related to this that was used, I think, independently by Ding and Sun for analyzing a, a different model of the easing perceptron that I won't get into today. Okay, so uh, at a bird's eye view, what, what we do to uh, prove some of these results for the orthogonally invariant SK model is to carry out a similar strategy, but using a system of tap iterations that are tailored to this rotationally invariant kind of couplings, right? Uh, so this was an algorithm that was introduced by Chakmak and Oper in 2019. Uh, the structure of the algorithm, I think, is motivated by these vector A and P kinds of algorithms that was, that, that was developed for linear models. Uh, and it's the algorithm that you see here. It's defined via a resolvent of this couplings matrix J. The specific form of the algorithm I don't think will be too important for what I'm, what I'm going to talk about. So, so just, um, you know, you can, you can ignore the form here if you would like. Uh, and then this, this hyperbolic tangent of H plus YT is the vector that's uh, conjecturally supposed to converge to the magnetization of the model. And I'll come back to this word conjecturally a little bit later in, in, in the talk. Okay, so from this algorithm, we can, we can uh, use a similar strategy of defining a filtration or a sigma field that's generated by the iterates of this algorithm, right? So in this J, there are two copies of this orthogonal matrix, and so we, de we decouple those two copies. Uh, so you have these, these, these iterates X, and then you're multiplying by this orthogonally invariant matrix, so we condition on X, we condition on one copy of O multiplied by X, uh, and, then, and then we condition on y, which is the second copy of O multiplied by uh, lambda times Ox. Right? And after conditioning on all of these things, uh, what we can then show is the following, that if you compute the first and second moments of the free energy conditioned on this partition function, then again, uh, you recover the replica symmetric predictions, IRS and 2's IRS. Okay. So let me explain a little bit how this computation goes. Uh, yeah, I think I do have time for this. So what happens is when you, when you condition on uh, these iterates, what you're conditioning on are these linear events in O, right? You're conditioning on uh, Ox being some fixed vector S, and then uh, O transpose lambda S being some other fixed vector Y. And so what you're really conditioning on is a linear conditioning event for this Haar matrix O, right? That O times some uh, N by, I guess, 2T matrix here is, is equal to some other matrix, yeah. And this linear conditioning event, you, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to characterize, and this is an idea that's been used a lot in the analyses of AMP algorithms for these kinds of models as well, that you have an explicit description of what this conditioned Haar orthogonal matrix should look like, right? So it has to, if I condition on the event that OA equals B, 
then uh, the matrix has to rotate A to B, so there'll be a deterministic rotation that moves A to B. And then in the space orthogonal to A, it still behaves as a sort of Haar independent random rotation in n minus k dimensions. So you can express it in terms of a reduced Haar matrix that's of size n minus k by n minus k. And you have this explicit representation. And now if I, uh, let me just do the, 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 the first moment as an illustration. So if I want to compute the first moment of the partition function conditioned on this filtration uh, in, inside the Hamiltonian, I have this uh, O transpose DO multiplied by sigma on both sides. And if we apply the conditional law of O, then there's going to be a component that's deterministic that projects sigma onto the direction of A. These are the AMP iterates. Uh, and then there's a component that's orthogonal to that that will remain, you know, you, that's, that still has this, this n minus k dimensional rotation, okay? Uh, and what, what you're uh, faced with is, is the task of computing the expectation of this exponential uh, that involves a quadratic expression in O tilde. Okay, and, and this you can compute using a spherical integral. So we formalize the following spherical integral that if I want to evaluate asymptotically uh, the expectation of an exponential of some uh, of, of, of this kind of quadratic looking expression in O, then you have this, this explicit expression involving an infimization over a scalar parameter gamma. This integral is, uh, is a sort of HCIZ type integral, right? So if you consider the case where there's no linear term, you don't have B and you just have this quadratic term, then this is exactly a rank one, uh, HCZ, a, a rank one HCIZ integral. Uh, and this uh, evaluation would take a more explicit form. It would be some integrated R transform. Uh, and, and this is a result that was shown by Guillaume and Maida in 05. Uh, and the extension to this kind of, um, to this kind of integral here is, is, is using the same ideas, right? So, so the way you prove this result is um, this vector OA is uniform on some sphere, so you can represent it as a Gaussian vector divided by its norm, and then you can do a large deviations analysis on that Gaussian vector to get this result. Uh, okay, so, so if you do this evaluation, then what you end up getting is just an expression uh, for this conditional first moment where uh, inside the exponent you have some functional of the empirical measure of all of these AMP iterates or these tap iterates that you've seen thus far together with the empirical measure of, of, this, of, the, of the eigenvalues D of your couplings. Uh, and the last ingredient of this analysis is a formal state evolution of these tap iterations, right? So as n goes to infinity, uh, the joint distribution of entries of all of these AMP iterations together with the entries of the external field and the entries of this diagonal matrix representing the eigenvalues of your couplings, uh, they converge weakly almost surely to some joint limit law. And there's an explicit characterization of this law, which I'm also not stating on this slide. But so if you pass, if you pass to this limit and then you apply a large deviations analysis, what you get very naturally is a variational formula that characterizes this conditional first moment, right? So if I fix an iterate T, as n goes to infinity, I get this variational representation of the conditional first moment. And the variational representation, it depends on a couple of things. So, the, so there, are, there are order parameters. The number of order parameters is, is, is scales with t. And these order parameters represent the inner product of sigma with your external field together with the inner product of sigma with all of your tap iterations up to that point. There are order t tap iterations. So you get these order t order parameters. Uh, and then when you do the large deviations analysis, it'll involve uh, the cumulative generating functions of these order parameters. So you get these dual variables that, that, you're, that you're now infamizing over. These are, these are capital UVW corresponding to these order parameters, uh, lowercase UVW. And then you have this additional infimum over this gamma that came from the spherical integral. Okay, so, so you have this kind of characterization. Uh, and then the rest of the analysis is, is to just to try to analyze somehow this low dimensional variational problem. Uh, and the following things are reasonably straightforward to see. So it's, it's not hard to guess, I think, what is the relevant fixed point of this, of this variational problem. And if you guess that fixed point and evaluate it, uh, you'll see that uh, in the limit as t, the number of AMP iterations goes to infinity, this gives you the replica symmetric prediction. It's also not hard to show a lower bound. So uh, if, if I were to fix these order parameters UVW at their correct values, uh, then the infimum over all of the other variables turns out to be convex. And because of this, this convexity, the optimum is actually achieved at, at the correct values also for these two parameters. Uh, and from this argument, you get a lower bound for, for this conditional first moment. 
Uh, and the part of this that's 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 more difficult to analyze is to show that that uh, is, is to show an upper bound to, to, to show the optimality of this fixed point. Uh, and f for this analysis of the upper bound, this is where we're using very crucially the high temperature assumption on the model that we have this. You know, we have this ansatz for what is the global optimum, and then we have a particular, it's a sort of crude specialization of the inner dual parameters based on the outer order parameters, so that the resulting function is actually concave in your order parameters. And this you can only achieve under some high temperature assumption in the analysis. Uh, but with this concavity, then we can also show that, uh, that, 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 that this, this, this values IRS is an upper bound. Uh, and combining these analyses, we, we get that uh, the conditional first moment com converges to, to this replica symmetric prediction. And the analysis of the second moment is completely analogous, so I'm not going to talk about this. Okay, let me pause again to see if there are questions. And... Okay, so uh, let me maybe go through some of the ideas at an even higher level for uh, the other parts of this. So for the TAP equations, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit curious, I guess, that, okay, we use this algorithm where we conditioned on the iterates of this algorithm, and this algorithm is uh, supposed to compute the magnetization, and, the, and I guess the reason why this method works is because it's an approximation to the magnetization. Uh, but I guess it's a little bit curious somehow that, that this, this argument itself doesn't uh, pro prove the TAP equations for the magnetization. So this required an additional idea. Uh, and okay, the idea is the following. So if I if I go back to these tap iterations of Chakmark and Oper, uh, by design these iterations will converge in, in, in sufficiently high temperature. By, by by design they will converge to a solution of the tap equations. So this is known, and in fact this convergence holds uh, in the full conjectured high temperature region. This was shown by Chakmark and Oper. Uh, however, what, what uh, we didn't know rigorously was that these iterations also converge to the magnetization, right? So, so, so in order to show that the magnetization satisfies the type of equations, it would be sufficient to show that uh, this algorithm indeed converges to the magnetization of the model. Uh, in the SK model, there was a result that showed that both Housen's type iterations converge to magnetization. Uh, this was done by Wei Chen and Zetang. Uh, and their argument used an equivalence of um, Bolthausen's tap iterations with a sort of cavity iteration where you remove one additional spin every iterate. Uh, and here, as far as I know, there's, there's, there's not a cavity method interpretation of this, of this algorithm here. And so we show this convergence using a different geometric idea that's related to this conditional second moment analysis I was just talking about. And the idea is the following. Uh, we consider a replicated system of capital N replicas. And you should think about capital N as being some fixed but large number. Uh, and you consider the restriction of the system of replicas to this band that's centered around MT, some large iterate of these tap iterations. Right? So in this space, you have this iterate MT. Uh, and then you consider uh, the, 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 the band of the hypercube that's uh, of, of, of your vector sigma that's orthogonal, where, where sigma minus m would be orthogonal to m. And then between the replicas themselves, we also consider restriction where they're pairwise orthogonal to each other. And the intuition for this restriction is that, you know, it's believed that, that these, these kinds of configurations of sigma would make the dominant contribution to the free energy, that everything else is, is asymptotically negligible. Uh, and this is an idea that's inspired by actually analyses of low temperature regimes of SK due to Subag and Chen and Penchenko. Uh, and maybe I can make a, a, a small caveat that here we're, we're not centering by the actual magnetization of the model. We're centering this band by the iterate of the TAP algorithm. Uh, which we're trying to show coincides with the magnetization of the model. But so the definition of this band is centered around MT, not the magnetization. Uh, okay, and then if you were to uh, extend a little bit this kind of uh, conditional moment analysis, you can show the following, that indeed uh, this, this, this restricted partition function uh, appropriately normalized by the number of replicas converges to the same replica symmetric limit as the unrestricted partition function. Uh, and, and you can do this using a variation of this, this conditional moment analysis that I was describing. And what this means is that if I were to look at the Gibbs measure of these, this n-fold replicated system, the probability that these, these replicas actually belong to this restricted band is something that's uh, better than exponentially small in n. 
right? So you'll have a probability. So in the exponent, the term that's linear in N vanishes as you take more and more AMP iterations. Uh, and then there's maybe some sub-exponential term in N. And this is the guarantee that you get about the Gibbs measure. Uh, and then the proof is concluded in the following way. So if you're on this event where these capital N replicas actually belong to this band, then there's, it's just a deterministic consequence of this that their average is going to be close to the center of the band, which is this vector MT. Uh, and on the other hand, if I look at the unrestricted system of replicas at sufficiently high temperature, that's going to concentrate around the true magnetization of the model. Uh, and this you can show using uh, a recent lok sobolev inequality for these high temperature spin systems that was developed by Bauer, Schmidt, and Badenau. Uh And this concentration will be exponentially good in N. Yeah, and if you combine these two things, what this implies is that this center of the band MT indeed has to coincide with the magnetization uh, for all sufficiently large uh, iterates T and all, all, large, all large N. Uh, and this shows that the algorithm converges to the magnetization. And, and because the algorithm uh, converges to a fixed point that satisfies the TAP equations, this shows that the magnetization satisfies the TAP equations. So this is the argument for TAP. a quick check on time. Do I have like five minutes roughly to talk about? Okay, so in five minutes I may maybe talk about some of these ideas in the linear model. So to analyze the linear model, uh, we, we extend this analysis um, using a similar kind of approach. So in the linear model, we have, we have uh, this model y equals ax star plus, plus noise, uh, and there's this equivalent scalar channel, which is uh, defined by this pair of two fixed point equations. Uh, and we also consider a tap iteration for solving the conjecture tap equations in your model. And then this, these, these, these iterations are what are commonly known as vector AMP in the literature. Right? So these are due, due to uh, Rangan Schneider and Fletcher, to uh, Keiko Takeuchi, and to uh, Ma and Ping. Uh, and I, I've massaged the form of the vector AMP iterates into this form. Uh, and again, I guess the precise form is maybe not too important for what I'm going to say. Um, but you see that this form is, 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 is analogous to these tap iterations uh, for the orthogonally invariant SK model that I showed earlier. Right, so it depends on a resolvent of this uh, matrix A transpose A. Uh, okay, and again, by design, these iterates uh, converge to a solution of, of, of this conjecture tap equation that you see here. Uh, okay, so what we do is to, is to carry out a similar conditional second moment analysis. Uh, for technical reasons, uh, because we're, we're considering cases where this prior might have unbounded support, it's helpful to just restrict the squared L2 norm of the sigma to some compact set. Uh, so we consider some truncated partition function, Z, for this model truncated to this U. Uh, and again, uh, we have the following computation. If you compute uh, if you compute the conditional first and second moments of this partition function for a sufficiently large truncated set, then you get uh, the replica symmetric prediction for the free energy and twice the prediction. Okay, for, 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 for the second moment, actually in this work, we only proved an upper bound. We were too lazy to prove the lower bound because you don't need it in the argument. But, but I think you can also prove a lower bound if you really want. Um, and then as a consequence, the uh, unconditioned free energy would converge to this replica symmetric prediction. Uh, and then this truncation is easy to remove. So if you truncate to um, a ball that's sufficiently large, it's not hard to show that the contribution, the free energy outside this ball is, is negligible. So you don't have to worry about this. Okay, so, so uh, this immediately implies uh, the limit of the mutual information because there's a very simple relation between the mutual information and the free energy. Uh, and then to understand the Bayes optimal MSE, you can do the following. So if I restrict this partition function to the set of vectors whose, uh, so let me remind you, this, this restriction is the squared difference between the vector sigma and the true signal x star. And uh, for, so, so the partition function will be dominated by vector sigma where this squared difference is, is concentrated around some value that's 2 eta star inverse. So if you restrict the partition function outside of this, then uh, you can repeat this analysis and show that the restricted partition function converges to something that's smaller than XIRS. And what this means is that uh, with high probability under the Gibbs measure, uh, this sigma would be close to, or, so sorry, the, the square difference between sigma and the planet sigma x star would be close to this value to eta star inverse, uh, both in high probability and then also in expectation, right? 
Uh, and then if you apply an Ishimori identity, uh, sigma and x star would each be then roughly one eta star inverse away from the mean of the measure by this Pythagorean relation. And so you get that uh, x star in particular, its difference to the, to the posterior mean of the distribution is roughly eta star inverse. And so, yes. Which, which implication? To this thing? Yeah, it's because the log partition, so the full log partition function converges to xi RS. And if I restrict away from this set of points, it converges to something that's less than xi RS. So the Gibbs probability of that restrict away from, from that point is exponentially small. Right, so so the total Gibbs measure of, of that, you know, of that large sheaf is something exponentially small in N, and then so you actually, I mean, this, you get, you, you get a much more quantitative version of the statement that the probability is actually exponentially small. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and then finally, uh, for the TAP equations, uh, we again prove that the vector A and P iterates converge to the posterior mean of this model. Uh, here, the argument I think is simpler than in the spin glass case because we can use Bayesian types of arguments to do this. Uh, so we can just observe the following, that if you have any estimator of, uh, of your true signal, uh, then by this Pythagorean relation with the Bayes estimator, so the square difference between any estimator and true signal is equal to the square difference to the Bayes optimal estimator plus the square difference of the Bayes optimal estimator to the true signal. Right, this is because the Bayes optimal estimator is the O2 projection of the true signal uh, onto the space of measurable estimators. Right, so you have this, this relation, uh, and then if you analyze the state evolution of VAMP as an upper bound, actually this is already known, that VAMP achieves an error that's, that's you know, conjectured to be Bayes optimal. And then if we were able to show that the Bayes optimal MSC indeed coincides with the error achieved by VAMP, then from this Pythagorean relation, what that implies is that the difference between the VAMP estimate and the posterior mean actually goes to zero in the limit as t goes to infinity. And this, this gives a very simple argument for convergence to the posterior mean. Uh, and, and by design, the VAMP iterates converge to a solution of TAP equations, and therefore the posterior mean satisfies the TAP equations. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. So I guess a one sentence summary of this talk is that predictions of the replica method and high temperature kinds of expansions for these uh, mean field models with rotationally invariant disorder can be shown rigorously using this approach of conditioning on the filtration of tap style iterations. Uh, and let me conclude with, with, with three open questions. So one, one open question that I know a lot of you guys in this room would be interested in is, is the validity of this replica symmetric prediction in the linear model without this high temperature restriction. Right? Of course, it's, it's also an open question to analyze this SK kind of model down to the actual right temperature threshold, but that, that feels harder to me than this question because there seem to be many more techniques that are available in the linear model. So this is one question. Uh, and then the, 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 the latter two questions are maybe related to each other. So I can say that um, when we first started thinking about doing these conditional moment analyses, we actually we weren't trying to do this conditional second moment analysis. What we were actually trying to do at the start was to see if these conditioning ideas can be used to actually try to make rigorous the high temperature expansion itself that was done by Plefka and Parisian plotters. Uh, and we, 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 we failed at certain points on how to do this, and so we settled for the second moment argument. Uh, but my feeling is that maybe something can still be done there, and I'm happy to chat about this if anyone's interested. Uh, and then related to this maybe is a question of the universality of these results, of the free energy, the mutual information, the Bayes optimal MSE. So Rishab on Tuesday gave a, a very nice talk about the universality of these AMP algorithms. And what that would imply is, is universality of the error that's achieved in these algorithms, right? So if you were to uh, apply AMP to do estimation, let's say, in this linear model with a design that's much more structured and rotation invariant, that result would show that you get the same uh, limiting error as you would in the orthogonally invariant design. But whether that limiting error is the best possible one, so how, so, so how to prove universality of the corresponding lower bound in these kinds of problems, I believe, is, is still open. Uh, and, and so this is something else that uh, perhaps people here would have ideas on how to do. Okay, uh, that's all, thanks.
Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Okay. Uh, the, my question is that uh, is it uh, easy or not to extend your method for the generalized linear model? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. We, we haven't, uh, I think it'd be very interesting to look at. We haven't looked into it. Uh, my feeling is that if you introduce an auxiliary field variable to represent a times x, and then that, that something can be done, but uh, do, we, we haven't really pushed in this direction. Yes, uh, last yeah. year that uh, Takahashi and I uh, published this paper, uh, actually that this is a replica method, so not rigorous. Uh -huh, sure. So I want, yes, uh, to know that it, it is, uh, how, how can we prove it is correct or <laughs> Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'd be interesting to look at. I mean, you do also have these general, you know, you have GAMP, GAMP kind of vamp, GAMP vamp algorithms for these models that are rigorous already. Uh, so I think it'd be interesting to look into. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zhu, for this very insightful talk on technical subject. It, it was very nice. Uh, I would like to, to understand a bit better uh, when you look, so I, I'm really not familiar with this second moment type of arguments, but there is a plethora of message passing type of algorithms for each of these problems. What's the motivation of picking one rather than another one uh -huh. in this proof? So I, it's not clear for me why in a model you took this, this uh, memory free tap, why is that useful, and then you, you consider the vector IMP. No, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, the reason we chose these algorithms is because they're the simplest ones and the analysis would become horrendously complicated if you look at other algorithms. I mean, okay, so for example, for the orthogonally invariant spin glass model, okay, we analyzed this, this memory-free algorithm of Chakmak and Oper, and there were previous algorithms developed by Oper, Chakmak, Winter that uh, use single step memory kinds of structures and things like this. There are some differences in the convergence of these algorithms. Like, for example, the latter one might not converge in the entire conjectured high temperature regime. Here, we're only restricting this to some very high temperature settings, so maybe that's not super relevant. But I think the most the most important factor for like you need to be able to do these computations, right? You you need to be able to to do this conditioning and then pass to this limit and understand these quantities, and the computations would become uh, I think quite tedious and challenging if we were to use some of these other algorithms that have this long memory structure and all of these free cumulants baked into them. So we, we never really made an attempt to use these other algorithms because these, these algorithms with much simpler structure are available. Uh, I don't see morally why if you, if you were to really try to do the analysis using one of these other algorithms, I guess I would imagine that the proof should still go through with an enormous amount of work. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. And a second question is, is more technical. If, if it's too long, we, we can skip for a later discussion. If you come back to a slide where you were uh, showing this nice relation of uh, equality in law between uh, projection of uh, oh, matrix okay. by an R matrix, you have this, this uh, conditioning on a linear system. And then you, yeah, yeah, I think it was the Yes. Next. Yeah, so the next slide, you use this here, yes. Uh, would like to understand why, at the level of the second line, when you use this identity, uh, this expression is simpler to deal with because you have a similar structure in a sense before, where you have this quadratic form. Uh, yeah, no, no. It's not that it's simpler to analyze than the first line. It's that if you don't do the conditioning and you just compute the unconditional first and second moments, you're not going to get, you're, you're not going to get the right uh, form of. Of the free energy, like the 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 log of the unconditional expectation of z. If you do that computation, it's not going to give you the replica symmetric prediction, and you you need to do this conditioning in order to recover the right result, uh, and that makes the computation more complicated. It doesn't make it simpler, but somehow you need to you need to extend the computation this way in order to okay. recover the result. I see. Yeah. And if I can last one, <laughs> okay. At some point you gave two conditions on the validity of one your formula. I think it was for le the linear system. You had two inequalities to be verified for. Uh, um, can, can you say that again? You had two, two conditions for the validity of one of your, or your, of your results. I think it was for the linear uh, model. You had uh, 
there were two inequalities, two conditions you provided for. Uh, do you mean? Do you mean in the spin? Do you mean the conjecture conditions for the validity? Yes, of this? exactly. Yes, okay. yes, thanks. What's the meaning of these conditions? Are they related to fundamental phase transitions, or are they technical? I think the first condition is the sort of standard stability condition of the replica symmetric solution, right? If you look, if you do a local stability analysis, this is the AT condition. The second condition, I don't have much understanding. I, I mean, it's, it's so, I guess one answer to this is when you evaluate this spherical integral, um, okay, if you, if you evaluate, if you evaluate this kind of spherical integral, you get this infimum over some parameter and I guess in some cases the infimum is attained at the boundary, yes. and in some cases it's attained in the interior. It's related to this. I think it's related to this the sticking where transition in the in the spherical integral where the the vector like kind of uh, sticks to the top I, uh, eigen vector. I guess. Yeah, I, I think it's related to this where this condition is. You know, it's um, it's saying that when you evaluate this, you get something that doesn't stick to the boundary and that the infimum okay. is attained in the interior. And again, under sufficiently high temperature, we can show that's always attained yes, yes. away from the boundary, but uh, I don't actually know. I think maybe, maybe my friend would know what's, what's the belief about, uh, about the replica symmetric behavior if the second condition is not verified. I think John's question maybe is what's the, what's the interpretation of the second condition here that this parameter is in the domain. Like if this condition is not satisfied, then what is the conjecture behavior of the model? Okay, yeah, so if not, it doesn't know, I don't know either, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's thank uh, Zoe again for the talk. Thank you. <laughs>